monumental installation, White Snow, open to the public at Park Armory Avenue. It's called WS, sorry, <laughs> which is based on the classical fairy tale Snow White. Today we are opening the show Rebel Devil Babel, which was inspired in part, by, in part by Nicholas Ray's classic film Rebel Without a Cause from 1955. There is a lot of crossover in themes, actors, film sets, etc. between these two shows and also with our current Uptown show Livecast and our previous show in this space with the wood sculptures. It's all part of Paul's fantastical world and we're lucky to see many bites and pieces come together here in New York. Paul and Damon, I want to thank you guys for putting on these amazing exhibitions. We are very excited to hear you speak about these projects. Tom, I know you're having an exhibition opening tomorrow. Thank you very much for being with us tonight. Okay. So, is that, can everybody hear? Can you hear in the back? Is that, can you hear in the back? Okay, so, so, we will do this. What if we talk like this? No. Um, okay, so, uh, yeah, my name is Tom Eccles. I um, work for the Center for Curatorial Studies at Bard College, and uh, I've had the privilege to work with Paul now 15 years, I think. And um, obviously this is the, you know, what Roberta Smith called the Paul McCarthy moment um, and in New York. And um, <clears throat> it's, I don't, I don't remember in my 20 years in the city a, a time when, I, when an artist has completely dominated the um, imagination um, of not only the art world, but now in increasingly uh, the public world in the city. And of course, we opened uh, WS uh, a, a couple of nights ago. There's been, there was a show, an incredible exhibition here three weeks ago that opened, closed, and now uh, has reopened again with uh, Rebel Dabble Dabble. Um, there's a show up town by, by Paul um, of the Life Casts, which is uh, astounding. Uh, to many of us, most of us, um, and um, I was just saying to Paul and to Damon that you know I, I, I don't even remember in my lifetime an artist who's commandeered the the press of this city uh, in such a way where actually there's actually a debate again. Um, one of the things we've we've lacked for a number of years is actually some serious discourse about what is at stake in art uh, and culture. Uh, in, in this city, which has uh, proposed itself as a, as a leader, but it's kind of lost its, lost its way to, to some extent. It's kind of interesting that uh, an artist from Los Angeles comes back to New York and, uh, and does this in this way with a gallerist who is uh, you know, uh, from Switzerland. So um, let's start. We're going to try to make some, some links between um, uh, what, what happened of, uh, here a few, uh, a few weeks ago, what's, what's the shop town, the Park Avenue Armory exhibition, and this, uh, this exhibition, this incredible exhibition that opens uh, tonight after this discussion. Um, and uh, this is a very, very informal talk, and then we'll um, open it up to, to questions, which uh, I'm sure you, of which I'm sure you have many. Um, the first, I think, the, through this kind of this sort of public presentation through the media that kind of really interests me, is you know the perception or, and description of Paul. And the Times uh, a few weeks ago in the Sunday Magazine with Randy Kennedy uh, led with the headline "The Demented Imagineer." Okay, so let's let me ask Damon how you would describe your father. <laughs> Uh, almost the same, probably, <laughs> but maybe also throw a baseball coach in there at the same time. Um, <laughs> I mean, I think as a, as a kid, I, I knew him as dad. I knew him as baseball coach. I knew him as a guy who worked 12 hours a day and then kind of disappeared into the studio, a.k.a. garage, and would figure out how to make fake beer. And I would try and go and figure out how to help him. And at that moment, it was, you know, that's a very early description of what my dad was as a kid. Now, it's much different. Um, we work together every day, and I think very clearly of how he's trying to 
make something and how to push it somewhere. And I try to help him make something and also push it somewhere in my own way. And when we do things like this, um, I think we independently work freely pushing something together somewhere else. I'm going to come back to, in, in a little bit, the nature of your collaboration with your father, um, which is now almost, almost for 10 years, but probably maybe more for 10 years. But I mean, you, you once described Paul as someone who was, was really a carpenter and laborer and then made art at night. And uh, I'd like to ask, uh, you know, Paul, um, from your, your biographical perspective, I mean, are, are there any influences in your biography? Your father was a butcher, I believe. Yeah, father was a butcher. butcher. Uh, your mother was a, a liberal Mormon. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. are, are there kind of any biographical touch points that you think have influenced the work over the years? Uh, well, I think growing up in Salt Lake City, which was an enclosed environment, uh, surrounded by mountains and uh, had a particular image of the patriarch. Uh, I think all of us grew up with uh, the image of the patriarch in institutions, schools, high schools, junior highs, and and I think I was uh, I think I was abnormally sensitized to it, and abnormally sensitized to the pressure of the institution. At the same time, there's this particular patriarch in Utah, which is very visible, and they create images about that. And it's the, the male in a suit, uh, a businessman to a sense, and uh, that kind of image. And there he controls everything in a very uh, uh, kind manner. Like the appearance is someone who's kind, but that the reality is, is that I'm growing up in a conditioned reality in which normality is conditioned. And I think at one point, probably at the period of 64, 65, I realize that in some intuitive way that I'm in a fucked up situation. And normality is not what it seemed to be for my entire growing up period. And, uh, and then I leave. <clears throat> How's that? <laughs> I mean, you've brought back one. You know, you brought back into the armor. In fact, the house, one one of the houses that you grew, grew up in. Yeah, um, it is the house I grew up in. It is. Um, you know, it is. You know, I think one of the things for for many of us that, and this comes up in, in almost every article about you, this kind of incredible fact that you're actually really a family man, and like, you know. You, you, you and Damon Ski and with Mara, and you, you know you have you actually are not really a patriarchal figure, you know, or the patriarchal figure that you present here. Um, and I'm, I'm kind of wondering, and everyone's, you know, I know I'm not going to go into the zone of, you know, well, what's your family life? But it's very interesting to people that that what you're representing here is clearly not a kind of personal experience, or or is it? Or, or does it come from, does it, what are you hitting at here in, in so many of the works, re, really all along the, the role of the male figure? I mean, the male figure is the dominant voice in, in probably all your work, you know, running from Rocky to the present day. And so, what's the question again? So is, well, the question is, you know, is there, is there something personal in this work that's driving, what, what motivates the work? Like, if it's not biography, then what is it? If it's not what? If it's not biography, then what is it? Well... No, it's a big question. <laughs> <laughs> We're here. Like a crash. Uh, I... <clears throat> well... I, I think that the... I, I think the subject of the male or the subject of the power image has been central from very early on. I was describing it earlier today that at a very early period, if I, you know, there's a whole body of work in which I dismissed and didn't talk about for years in which uh, there were three central themes or certain themes that went on. One was the image of a tree which had the head of a male and underneath the tree of the, with the head of the male were 
a series of uh, females, and uh, the females were always drawn in positions in which their legs were spread. And these paintings and drawings happened in the early 60s. And in the case at the head of the tree, or on top of the tree, was a head which was covered in a mask and was always a male. And I look at it and I think, what the fuck was that? And why did that happen? And why does it repeat itself again, over and over again? And basically, the females and the males existed in an architectural square. And that, in though it looks like a sort of uh, Byzantine, or maybe even I was interested in Byzantine art, whatever, the fact that things were segregated into boxes had to do with architecture and the fact that we build these fucking boxes over and over again that we place human bodies in and then the bodies make up these males and females and the females with the legs spread open is that i began to view it as the juice it's the juice that motivates us in it and then there's this thing of the male as the masked creature and uh, the patriarch in some way, and there starts the story. And what it's exactly about, I couldn't fucking tell you, but it repeats itself over and over again. Uh, and what, I mean, hu humiliation also plays a huge part in the work. Like even from the, from the earliest works, from um, uh, Class Fool, from Rocky, and what, you know, um, I mean, more Class Fool than Rock in 76. So th what, what, what role does that play that, for you? Because one of the things that's kind of, obviously very, very important to the work that is actually that you're in, you're, you're in the work, it's you. You know, I think that, that, that drives, I think, a lot of the kind of emotional power of um, both this work and the work at the Armory. And it drives the kind of emotional resonance of many of the earliest works that, that you, you know, these are, uh, what do you call them? Performative videos. They're not. They're not videos. They're not. They're not films. You're not acting. You're performing. <clears throat> Humiliation. That was the first word. Right? Yeah. <laughs> um, I. I. It's. It's a hard one to figure out, but somehow there's some sort of, in the position of, the, of being humiliated, you realize something. And that we exist in humiliation. And as, as, a society, as a culture, as a humanity, we exist in our own humiliation in which we've, it's almost the construction of who we are is that we humiliate ourselves. But I think, you know, there's also this, I think what for me has always been incredibly impressive in your work is there's always something at, at stake. And I tried to say the other day at the Armoury, and, you know, I'm not exactly sure what it is for you, but, you know, Paul Schimmel um, had said that, you know, risk is what keeps him pure. And what are the risks for you? Every work goes beyond the previous work. Like, you, the themes remain kind of the same. The tropes somewhat change, and we'll get on to that between fiction and reality, re fictional characters and, and real characters. But there seems to be something at risk for you in this. Uh, I don't... It's not risk. <laughs> I don't think it's risk. I think it's like trying to get to something and you may cross another line, that's all. You cross the next line and you say, well, okay, there's the edge of the taboo and you cross that line. And maybe the risk is, is that the taboo that you cross is a taboo that you shouldn't cross or that it's the taboo that doesn't make sense to cross or it's the taboo that actually has some reality. You shouldn't cross the fucking line. On the other hand, it's, so it's always kind of like, I guess that's maybe the risk, but it's, it's kind of like, I, I just, as an artist, you establish, you find the line, and then you cross that line, or you define that line, or you see it, and you see it in another way, and you go, oh, it's easy. It's not a big fucking deal. Culture just told me it was a big fucking deal. It's not a big fucking deal.
It's actually all it was was something to control us. Well, let me ask you, Damon, because you, you were just talking about this at the bar, that, that now the opportunities sort of seem, not the opportunities, but the, <clears throat> that, that anything is, is possible now in a way that it wasn't, both kind of economically and, and artistically. And you know, where do you see the kind of opportunities there? And let's go back to that thing. Where, where do you see the risks in that? I, I don't ever really see it as a risk. I mean, I think it, I see it more as an opportunity. I think that um, maybe before in, in earlier work, uh, there was a limit only because there was less access to being able to make something without a limit. And I think now um, we're at a point now being I can I can bring a technology level to him, and I can and I can also help him push something, and I can think in a way that I think that also provokes the way that he thinks that that there isn't there isn't the, there isn't a risk. I, I don't ever feel it as a risk. A risk things that it, it seems like I, I there's something to lose. I, I never feel like there's something to lose. I mean, a risk it makes you feel like there's you're gambling, and I don't feel like we're gambling. I feel like we're we're pushing. And in a lot of senses, I feel like that's a lot different than losing something. Like let, let me ask with the Armory project uh, with WS, because we, we're all very unsure what happens next with that, that project. Uh, you know, they, right now everyone's talking about the project going back to Los Angeles, back to your studio. It kind of it now has more years of work. I mean, for, for both of you, where does, it, where does a project start and stop nowadays? I, I don't know. I kind of feel like that there is only one project, and that's just for us to continue to make art, and that there isn't a stop and start, that there's just a continuation, that we now take this piece home, and because we hit, we're limited in time, but we really only had 11 months to start White Snow and finish White Snow and put it in the building, that became the only limitation. It wasn't about whether or not we were limited on what we were doing. It just was about that we only got this far in the story. So now the next step is we go, we go home and we finish the story. So it wasn't ever a moment where we were concerned where it was going or how it was going. It was just how far would we would get. And in 30 days of shooting, we could only get that far. Where do you think, Paul, where do you think the, the, the project will go from here? Because I think you've, you've, with this, it very subtly, you've been very, very aware of a, ch of a changing landscape within, perform within the video, within the film, that the, the boundary between reality and fiction is now very blurred. You said it to me a number of times. And, and it gets even, even blurrier in this project here at House and Verth tonight. Like what you're capable of doing. Like, like before it was kind of clearly you. Now there's these kind of dual characters uh, playing out. Also in, in the armory, you have uh, you know, automaton figures. You have, you know, your production values are so high today that they kind of replicate the highest of studios in the United States, no? Mm -hmm. Higher. I mean, I think higher. I mean, you, you take studios in LA. You don't have you don't have people that will go as far as like, you know, Elise would go places where actresses won't go. There's a moment there where she'll take her her mind someplace where I, I don't think a lot of actors would go. I mean, James didn't go there, so it's it's a place of of difference now. Like we've opened doors and minds that maybe we can push things further. But it also comes back to, I mean, I think for, with you, Paul, you've, you've talked about your work as a program of resistance, like a kind of critical program of, of resistance to how reality is presented in the, certainly within our culture, you know, let's just call it American culture, for example. Mm -hmm. you know, just, mm -hmm. um, I think it's one of the role, or it's maybe the role of art, it's the role of resistance. And push. And push. Like, I think we have to push back at them. So, I mean, it may be a role that maybe not all artists operate in, and it may not be the definition of art, but it's the role that I operate in. It's the role of resistance to the, to the, to the conditioned resistance. 
It's an opposition. I mean, the condition, the condition culture. It's the resistance to the condition culture. And, well, maybe we could talk about, you've talked about this, the, the, the various projects in New York over the last month as being one project or all part of the same project. It, it, you know, it's weird how it happened, you know, like we were, there were a number of pieces being worked on before James Franco showed up and one of them was, one of them was Snow White or at the time, I don't know, I think we called it White Snow, we called it Snow White, right? I, th I think it was just an, uh, an adverse yeah. thing too. And there was Snow another White. one which was uh, building a town in the desert and then there was one which was building a series of other western films. We had these projects going on and but all of a sudden we sort of were really focusing on Snow White and we had built this model which would fit in our studio and and uh, and uh, Franco came along and said, you know, like, would you guys like to make a movie with me about Nick Ray and Natalie Wood? And then we we looked at, you know, Damon and I, and we went and looked at the building where Nick Ray and Natalie Wood and James Dean and Sal Mineo all spent time in, which was bungalow number two at the Chateau. And, and uh you know, like immediately we walked away from the conversation with James thinking, God, kind of freaky how <laughs> Natalie Wood is sort of Snow White and the dwarves are Nick Ray, James Dean, uh, Sal Mineo, Dennis Hopper. They're all the dwarves scattered around and huddled around. Uh, this woman. This woman. And, and then the woman being this sort of young starlet. Uh, starlet that was a kind of, you know, person of desire. and and then Nick Ray, and, and uh, then the house itself being a kind of dwarf house. And I had already done all these drawings of, Snow, of the Snow White house or the dwarf house as a house with staircases. And, and then I'd drawn a whole series of underground chambers and that would go underneath this dwarf house. And it was all about the staircase of trauma that the trauma occurs in the staircase. And, and we go in this building, and central to the building is the staircase. And, and we're thinking, fuck, do we do this? Because if we do this, you know, your creative process is already moving in one direction, and the ideas are already forming, and they're forming, and they're forming, and they're forming. And then now if you switch over and you go over to this James Franco thing, do you then give all the ideas that have sort of taken months to form or years to form off to this project called Rebel. And we really thought hard about it and it was a real problem. And then at one point we went, fuck it, let's go for it. And we'll use it as a preliminary to Snow White. We'll see what happens. And then we went through a whole process with James Franco, which was Franco involved, but then Franco not involved? Like, where was he? We were supposed to meet today. Where was he, right? <laughs> and, He's in Detroit. I mean, and it was three hundred thousand dollars. Where was the fucking three hundred thousand dollars? And we sort of realized at one point we're on our own in some extent. Yeah. You know, I think. But I, we were already too deep at that point. We were so deep then... into it. We'd already committed, and in one way. I, it wasn't about Franco being a bad guy. He was actually a good guy. That was kind of the smile was perfect. Yeah, and, he was the prince. And he was the prince. And, <laughs> and every time he came in the room, we were just totally seduced by it. Yeah, and, uh, the smile killed us every moment. It and we would buy him up. lunch. <laughs> <laughs> and this thing would go on. And then, but we made the decision that it was a preliminary to Snow White. And then it was a whole discussion about who. And then it was okay. It was okay. We made the decision. We will build the house. We yeah. will build the bungalow. And we will... And we will make this thing. And we'll make it. And then we start writing on... I start drawing tons of drawings, and we start writing scripts. And then it's a matter of who will play the part of Natalie Wood. Who will... He wanted me to be Nick Ray, and I'm thinking, wow, crazy, dude. Nick Ray has an affair with Natalie Wood. Nick Ray has an affair with Sal Mineo. Dude, how far do I go with this? Do I have a sexual affair with Natalie Wood? What is this thing about? Why am I being, you know, what's this? Gonna, where do we take this? Where's James in all this? 
is James James Dean, but then James Dean, like he can stay to the side of it. He's kind of the sideliner to the whole thing. It's the easy side. He's the easy side, and you're thinking, okay, the commitment is not just the money that we put into this thing, it's not just the building we build, it's that it's a psychological commitment, it's a commitment to people, it's a commitment to who we are. And, and, uh, and to the work. And I the mean, work. At some point, you've got to believe that you're making something that matters. Yeah. And that was difficult. Like, I mean, could we make something that fucking matters? difficult. Matter? Because we committed before we were really sure that we were making something that mattered. And then we had to make it matter. Well, I wonder whether it, this what, is... What I was going to say is what happened is, is that we entered this adventure, right, without James. And then there was a whole thing. We could get Lindsay Lohan to play Natalie Wood. We could get so-and-so to play Natalie Wood. We could get movie stars to play. Well, of course we could. James Franco was in the thing. It, meant it, it made things like that Everything possible. was accessible. Things were accessible. And then we thought, fuck it. What if we take it from another approach and we just say, we will control it. Yeah. We will control this situation. We will pull it back into what we believe is art, not what the art not what the Hollywood believes is art, but what we believe is art. Because ultimately, you're limited there. Yeah, you have a. I mean, the accessibility is easy, but the limitations are. So we take grand. on we take on this thing, and we audition the people. We determine who people yeah. will be. We don't allow Hollywood to tell us who people will be and who will be Natalie Wood and who will be Sal Mineo and who will be whatever, and we will determine the situation within the boundaries of what art is and within our own parameters. And so we audition people and uh, the connection, at that point we were already deep into, uh, we'd gone pretty deep into uh, Snow White, abandoned it, gone into Rebel. Uh, I, I wouldn't say abandoned, we just stuck stopped it somewhere it. else. Yeah, and then what happens the, the project of that girl or the project of the live cast had been going on for a very long time. Years. I'd, years. I'd years. wanted to it do it for years. It was just about how we could do it. And, and you, knowing that to really make something at that level of perfection um, required a lot. And, and we, didn't, we didn't have that yet. Yeah, we didn't. We, we didn't have we, that technology to, to make that happen yet. We'd made them ourselves and in that device that that you can enter. And right now it's in a presentation mode, but you put it in, a, in our space in uh, LA and we have a device to go back into it and what do we explore? I, you know, I'm here like <laughs> two weeks. At one point I write an entire story, like a week ago while I've been sitting in New York. Story was the animals put her on trial, she's killed, and so is Walt. And it's the death of Snow White and the death of Walt, and they die because of uh, the animals. The animals decide to put them on trial. Uh, whether that becomes the story, whether that's version two, I don't know. We wait and see, you know, like we have two or three other projects uh, that we've been wanting to do, and, you know, do we go back and make Snow White? There's a good chance. Let me ask you, there's, there's, you mentioned this, you know, James Franco doesn't show up, costs $300,000, because you've got this huge production setup going. You're making a film, and, uh, you know, have, has the nature of the production of the work, or the scale of the production of the work, but the nature of it really changed uh, the way in which you think about the work, or in fact the way in which the work ultimately is made. And these may be no longer, or maybe this, Installation here is no longer uh, a performance video, whereas maybe the armory still might be. Do you know the way? I remember with the armory, you said to me when we were talking before any filming had happened. You said, "Well, you know, we we start we start the dinner, we start the dancing, we we start partying, and then it gets crazy." And like, I was like, "Well, how crazy?" <laughs> like, you didn't totally know because it was a performance. Like, it wasn't completely scripted. And I think you really sense that in, in, the, in WS. Whereas, I, I mean, I don't know, I had nothing to do with this, The Rebel. It feels to me a much more scripted project. This? Yeah, am I wrong in that? Yeah. Pretty wrong. Yeah. <laughs> Not the first time. <laughs> there's no script in there. <laughs> no, there's no script in there. 
It was more it, script than Snow White. Yeah, briefly. I mean, it was more discussions. I mean, I think that it, when we made this thing, there was a script, but not in the sense of like you're you have lines to do. It was more like um, scenes to do, a discussion of a scene, a synopsis of that. I think the script for Snow White was basically written by me on a weekend. Yeah. And I think it was a and maybe followed half 12, 14 hour weekend. And then a series, there were tons of drawings done, a lot. And then it was a matter of taking all those drawings and typing it up and getting it into some kind of form and, and refining it over a little bit over time. And that all happened. And then we had, I think at one point I had, I'd really wanted to do rehearsals, like the, the performers rehearsing. And I think other than the contract scene, there wasn't a rehearsal. But maybe Cooking Show had one. Uh, Cooking Show had a, a, a small rehearsal. And, like one and, day. And contract maybe had a couple rehearsals, but I think ultimately the rehearsals didn't translate as much into the actuality of shooting as, as thought they might. And it was so rushed, you know, at the time we were, when we made the commitment to do the armory, we were rushed. And um, it took, I mean, literally we built the set and did the shooting like in a... Nine months. Nine months. Like, which is... Start to finish. Start to months. finish nine months, which is kind of quite a bit. And especially when you have no idea how to, what you're doing. <laughs> <laughs> I, have, I have one more question that I'm going to open up to, to, the, to the audience. Um, this, this project was first shown at The Box, which is Mara McCarthy's fantastic gallery in Los Angeles, which you must visit. Um, there's a quote on the website from Paul, says, Hollywood film is a populist medium along with its cousin, the adult entertainment world, primarily financial and profit motivated. Given the population, what if desires and what, what is conditioned to want? The dream machine. Art as a dangling participle. And for the life of me, I don't know what that means. <laughs> Good luck. What, art as a dangling participle. I, it's poetic. <laughs> <laughs> I think in some ways I imagine art as a dangling thing. It, culture sits there in its, uh, its presence and it sits there in its security and its, its uh, conceit. I think uh, normality sits in conceit, that it has it figured out, that who we are and what we are as humans is figured out. And we're just going to have to try and figure out some of the details, but basically we got it nailed. And there lies its conceit. And I think art is a dangling partis partis participle, dangling participle in that it hangs off of that normality on a very thin string, and it asks the questions, or it says you don't know what the fuck you're talking about. I think that's what I So think. take uh, any questions? Yeah, I have a question. Dana, you and I were discussing this briefly at the Army, but I had noticed that in the uh, costumes, the dwarves are often wearing academic hoodies um, with the, the names of the universities. And I was just curious uh, if some, in terms of pushing against the status quo, if there's some commentary being made here about academic, uh, about arts education. Uh, no. 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 Not at all. No. It's not about art education. Yeah. Next question? Fair enough. Yep. <laughs> yep. I think that, in a way, I mistrust or I mistrust linear language to explain anything. And I think that uh, it, 
you know, it's to create the language, like an abstraction of language. I think I believe in abstraction as a truth rather than a linear explanation or a, a, language. a logic, you know, a type of logic, language through a type of log logic. And so it's to break that down. Fracture. To break it down, yeah, and fracture. Yeah. They do that? The, the idea of what? Rush. Being rushed. Being, you know. Rush. It's one of the effects of overproduction and capitalism. How do you deal with that and how are you going to drive that icon in your work? I, I think that you can make a choice as an artist. You can make a choice to withdraw from culture. And in that, you say, fuck you to the rush. You say fuck you to the privilege. You say fuck you to ex exploiting the privilege. You say fuck you to all that. And in one way, that's a choice you make. It's to withdraw, which is a very legitimate situation. In one way, in another way, I made a very clear decision, probably in the 80s, to enter the system and to try and create through the system. And, to, and my belief is to... It's always, it's been this thing where I said at that point, I will try and make it the appropriation and the image of a B-movie studio. I will try to create the image that art has substance. And by that, you also make compromises. You make the compromise to accept the rush. I end up in a fucking situation where either you get the New York Armory today or you, or don't. you don't get it. And you can say to yourself, fuck you, I'm gonna, it's going to take me four years to make this piece. Or you say to yourself, I'm going to rush because I believe that if I put that in the armory, it does something. It's supposed to be there. It's supposed to be there. So let's rush. We accept the boundaries of what we don't believe in order to push the resistance. It was actually very difficult to, to go. Very there. difficult decision. And it was a decision, it was a decision to accept push to create a resistance at a scale that we thought might be interesting. Like, could we actually do something? And of course, you, Damon can say we don't gamble. We actually gamble on some levels is to, you know, like I was reading the Jerry Saltz article, and he goes, well, it's, uh, it's silly, it's cartoonish, it's, car it's uh, clownish. Of course it is. That was part of the situation. Part of the image is to be the clown. Yes. It's a lot of years I'm asking you about between that piece and the present. But was it about you had more opportunities? You mentioned technology. Is it dealers were giving you, um, were able to help finance things? How do we go from the two figures and the animal that were in the museum? What about the garden? Yeah. How do we go from there to I this? Mean, what, what I, I don't want to ask about your whole career, but was it about opportunity? Was it about learning about technology? I, on a, okay, one thing that did happen, we were all, or a lot of people were, you know, ended up in a financial bubble, I think. That financial bubble dumped a shitload of money into the art world. And that's part of it, you know, all of a sudden, Bam. I never sold a work of art till 1990. That piece, those, a lot of those pieces were made in the early 90s as the bubble began to change. <clears throat> it, you know, I, I think I joined Hauser and Wirth at one point, and Hauser and Wirth, I think, was, in one way, it's two things. It's a gallery that moved quickly through the, finance, through the bubble and the finances of the art world 
and I all of a sudden found myself just connected to a machine, a financial machine. And but the also second, a gallery that provided complete support. Yeah, what we and there was so there was a financial we support. Then you had another thing. I was actually privileged to a gallery that never said no. Yeah. They and, believed in what we were doing. And then I kept saying to myself, and I went through transitions. Uh, I made pieces in which, you know, I made a, a switch. You know, in the 80s, I think you had, you had what happened in the painting with Schnabel and David Sally. And, and then you had the Europeans, Polka and Richter. And you had all this happened in the 80s. And then you had this whole thing of Kippenberger and Kuhns and the Kelly and all this thing that happened to sculpture in the late 80s, early 90s, and a change in what I saw. And then you, I had a lot of friends who were part of the 70s in alternative art who never saw the fucking change happen. They couldn't believe it happened. They couldn't believe that Paula Cooper took over. They couldn't believe that David Sally happened. It all, bam, bam, the alternative art world was over before they fucking knew it. And they didn't make the choice to make the change. And the change was, did you enter a gallery or not? Did you go into the gallery world as it happened in that period of time? And I, you know, I had friends who did. Burden had always been part of the art world, always been part of the gallery scene. I never was. Mike comes up with the gallery scene. He's born in, out of Cal Arts. He comes right into the gallery scene, bam, as it happens in the 80s. I made a switch to go into sculpture. Not because of the art world. I made a switch in the, to sculpture because all of a sudden I got interested in, could I make robotic objects? And it was based on some sense to a, a, a Vito Acconci comment. Conchi said at one point, could I make something that replaces me in the performance? And by that point, I think from the performances I had done, in the, I went through a period where I did 13 performances in three months, and basically, along with drugs, pretty much found myself insane. <laughs> and it was a period where I said, okay, maybe I make sculptures now. Maybe I replace myself. And I make a replacement. And it also coincided with what was happening. It was the switch from painting to sculpture which was initiated by F. Goldberg, Coons, Kippenberger, Mike Kelly, and later, I think, uh, Charlie Ray and some other people in America, right? And I entered that world, and that world all of a sudden became the world of the gallery scene, and the, it, it functioned like that, and I was swooped up in it. And then you can make the choice. Do you stay in the gallery scene? And, you know, for sure there have been artists who have tested that, you know? Part of Mike Kelly's problem was, in the end, was he couldn't deal with that. He couldn't deal with the money. He couldn't deal with what he thought was affecting his work. Jason Rhodes, same thing. Could they deal with this money thing that was influencing their work? Because it's pretty potent. All of a sudden, you're given pretty fucking crazy when you're given a million dollars and you've never had fucking 10 cents. It's a potent thing. And what you do with that begins to be pretty critical. And I think for me, it was like, you, I had to think back, what was critical in my work? And what was critical in my work was sailor's meat. Because in that piece, something fucking happened. So how do I return back to that? How do I return back to the psychology of the body? And are these pieces successful? I don't know, but the attempt is that. That is the attempt. And the attempt is also to make something at a scale that changes something, and that's within the belief of art. Do I believe that somebody can change something within the fucking belief of being lost in the redwoods? And the answer is yes. I do. I mean, I do believe that you can make work outside of the system that's critical. But I also believe that I will try to make the attempt to make something within the system that changes something. You know? So it's, uh, it's the push. And it is the push against normality, which I think is fucked up. I was going to say that's a very, very good point to uh, end this uh, conversation. <laughs> so I'd really love to. Uh, yeah, a few more beers, I'll have a lot more. Thank, thank uh, <laughs> Paul McCarthy and David McCarthy.
Thank you. Thank you all.